How's it going, everybody? You guys all having a good morning so far? Yes, absolutely. Hey, thank you guys for being here with us. I'm excited to jump into week three of this series. But before I do that, I want to let you guys know about something coming up in a few weeks. If you haven't noticed, summer's kind of winding to an end, and what they call up north, this thing called fall, uh, here it's uh, in Texas, it's just kind of like less summer, uh, is approaching quickly. And uh, like Benji talked about, football season's coming. Anybody excited for football? Yes, football season is coming. Yes, I know you guys are so excited to watch the Packers. Absolutely, I know, me too. Uh, no, football's coming, and the fall is coming, and vacations are winding down, college students are going to be coming back. And, you know, it's a fun season for us in the church. We've got some exciting things planned for this fall. And one of those things is a series we're going to be doing in just a few weeks. We're finishing out this series on James over the next few weeks. And then on August 27th, we're going to start a brand new series called Frequently Asked Questions. And here's what we'd like to do. As we know that there's going to be college students coming back and families coming back, we want to start answering some questions that, that maybe you've been asking. So we want to give you an opportunity opportunity to ask some questions to the church, and we will do a, a series just answering those questions. So here's how to ask the questions, is you can text in your question to, to the church line at 512-298-2013, or email your question at info at iconchurch.com. So maybe you've got some questions about God, or the Bible, or anything. Maybe, maybe you've been wondering, you see Steve Cochran come up here, and you go, how does he keep his head that bald? You know, like, you've got some serious questions, you want to ask Benji if gingers really do have a soul. I don't know what it is, what your questions are. Um, hopefully, please give other questions than just those. It's going to be a really interesting series if that's all we get. But, but seriously, what are some heavy questions that you've wrestled with or, or maybe have friends or family members or coworkers, neighbors that have asked you questions and asked you this hard question, you sit there going, um... Jesus, you know, and like that's the best you can come up with and you don't know. And this would be a great time because we want to speak to those things that uh, questions that culture is asking, questions that you are asking. Uh, so submit those questions. Here's what we'd like you to do. We want you to submit questions starting today. So right now you can get out your phone, you can text in or email in some questions because we'd like to prepare for those instead of the week of going, hey, let's figure out what we're talking about. So uh, you can start sending in your questions now and we'll begin uh, to prepare to answer those. So thank you guys for doing that. Uh, but today we're jumping into week three of our series, James the Just, uh, on the book of James. And church history tells us that James, kind of the name he was given, uh, was James the Just. He's the brother of Jesus. And he writes this letter, and we've been looking at this because this letter is so profound, so helpful, so practical, so challenging. And we want to look at this, and we've been kind of pulling truths out of this for the past couple of weeks. And now we find ourselves in chapter three. Three. And what I love is there's kind of two main themes in this chapter that we'd like to talk about today. And I think it's something that we could learn a lot from. And the two main themes in this chapter are this idea of there's words and there's wisdom. We have words and we have wisdom. And these two ideas, James says, are really inextricably linked. These two things go together in ways that sometimes it's, we kind of miss. And, and there's something, in fact, that happens in this chapter as we read through it that we kind of miss and we kind of separate these two ideas. It's easy to kind of think the first part of James 3 is kind of about one idea and the, the next part of James 3 is kind of about another idea. But this is actually something that we all deal with every single day. I mean, we all experience uh, these things, words and wisdom, and sometimes um, we have these, we have words without this, right? We have words without wisdom. Sometimes we say things that we regret. Has anybody had a case of uh, like foot and mouth disease where you say something and as the words are coming out of your mouth, you're like, no, you know, and you're wishing you could take those back. You say something in the heat of the moment. Somebody says something to you and you get kind of triggered. You get mad and you say something back and you're like, oh man, you regret it. You say something to your spouse or to your kids that you find yourself working back. Or many of you, if you're like, if you're like me, sometimes you find yourself in the shower thinking through that argument. And you're like, oh yeah, and I could have said this and I should have said that. And that's where you get like all the best comebacks. And you're like, how can I get back to, no, it just doesn't work, you know? And, and yeah, we all struggle with kind of taming the tongue and saying the things that we want to say and not saying the things that we don't want to say. Uh, I have a friend, it was actually a pastor of mine, who probably one of the nicest, most kind people I've ever met in my life. Very pastoral, very, I mean, just 
just a great, great guy. And uh, I loved getting to work with him. And he told me the story one time. He was at the grocery store. He was at HEB. And he saw someone from the church that he hadn't seen in a long time. And when he saw her, he waved at her and went over to her. Because that's just who he is. When he sees people out there, he connects with them. And, you know, so he went up and talked to her. And she did what, what happens so many times in the church. Like, if I see you, like, out there in the real world, it's kind of like when you're a kid and you see your teacher, like, at the store. And you're like, oh, this is awkward. Like, she's supposed to be in the classroom. And, and sometimes I get it. Like, I'll see people that haven't been in church in a while. And I'll go up to talk to them. And they'll instantly will be like, I've been busy um, with things and I've been sick for six weeks, you know, and like instantly it's like, hey, it's fine. It's okay. Like, you don't have to like, it's okay. And this person kind of started doing that. And, oh, I've been real busy. And he said, oh, no, I'm sure. I totally understand. Especially, you know, with what's been going on in your life, I'm sure. Like, life's been pretty busy. And she said, yeah, it's been really busy. Haven't been able to come to either church in several months. And he goes, yeah, you know, I, I get that. I totally understand. And I said, sir, he goes, speaking of, you know, like, so how far along are you? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you see where this is going, right? And um, she hadn't been there in several months. And uh, she goes, uh, and then she realized what he's asking. She goes, oh, uh, I'm, I'm not pregnant. And instantly, right, we feel that, like the crowd, right? And so he just feels so awkward. And again, this is the nicest guy in the world. So clearly, you know, to get himself out of it, he's like, oh, I'm so sorry. I, I mean, I, I apologize. I'm so sorry. I mean, you know, so how old's the baby? Was it boy or girl? Yeah, yeah, you get it, right? You know, and so he's trying to dig himself out and he's just digging a deeper grave. And she says, yeah, I, I haven't had a baby. To which, you know, clearly he's basically asking, so you're fat now, you know? I mean, he just cannot, and he's like, oh my gosh, I'm so sorry. At that point, I'd go, so I'm pastoring at Second Baptist now, and uh, you know, you can feel free to go over there or not anytime you want. Like he just, oh, one of the worst, like open mouth, insert foot, like just brain, stop talking, right? Like we've had moments, maybe it's not to that extreme, but where we've said things and we regret it. We say stupid stuff or we get angry and we say something we don't really mean. We find ourselves in a moment and we're, we're meaning stuff, but we, we don't end up saying it. And this is something we all experience. And James actually speaks to this. In chapter three, James says this. He says, we all stumble in many ways. He's, he's like laying groundwork. And I, I love what James is doing. He's getting everybody on the same page. And he goes, we all stumble in lots of different ways, don't we? Yeah, absolutely. Every single one of us in this room, nobody's perfect. We all stumble in so many ways. And then he goes on, anyone who is never at fault in what they say is perfect and able to keep their whole body in check. So James says, yeah, we all mess up in a multitude of ways, but the guy, the, the man, the woman who is able to control their tongue is perfect they can keep everything else in check. James is like saying, that's the thing that's hardest for everyone to keep in check. It's our words. It's what we say. It's, it's the things that we do when we feel angry and how we respond to those things. James is saying, I get it. Yeah, we all mess up in so many ways, but this is the area that everybody, probably more than any other thing, this is where they trip up. It's in their words. It's in what they say. And I think we'd all agree and say, yeah, Absolutely. In fact, a couple verses later, I love uh, in the paraphrase, in the message paraphrase of this, uh, he puts it this way. He says, by our speech, we can ruin the world, turn harmony to chaos, throw mud on a reputation, send the whole world up in smoke and go up in smoke with it. Smoke right from the pit of hell. We see this all the time, don't we? We see this when we watch the news. We see this when we watch entertainment. We see this all the time. I mean, the past couple years, I feel like we've been on a constant cycle of this, right? We go through a political cycle and this new thing happens and, and we're constantly seeing speech throwing the world into chaos. We see people throwing mud at people's reputation. We see people speaking hateful about other groups of people. We see this all the time. This could have been written today for us, right? I mean, James is talking about something that is so present right here and right now. We see this all the time. And, and here's the question, how do you keep from that? I mean, really, how, how on earth, how do you change your speech? I mean, if we find ourselves in that place, well, how do you tame the tongue, as James says? 
How do you learn to give life with your words and not steal it away? Because James says that the power of life and death is in the tongue. Have you ever been in a place where you feel so discouraged, you feel like a failure, and you're just beating yourself up and heaping on the punishment and somebody says one encouraging word to you? What does that do? How does that just lighten the load? Doesn't that just breathe life into you when someone's encouraging? And what's so funny is I feel like the power of death is a little bit stronger when it comes to the tongue because somebody can say, you know, 10 nice things and then one person says something ugly and what do we remember? The one thing, don't we? That's the thing we repeat back to ourselves. That's the thing that we keep coming back to. And people may have said uh, just tons and tons of great things, but it's that one critical word that tears us down. How do we fix this? What do you do with this? I mean, James is saying, this is something we all have a problem with. I think if we went around, I think every single person would say, yes, sometimes, oftentimes I say things I regret. I say things I shouldn't. Some of you, your spiritual gift is sarcasm, right? Like I get it, I know. Like we, that, that's, the, that's the gift we have is we can be sarcastic. We have an ability to say something that's joking, but has just enough truth in it to cut. Have you ever met someone like that? You ever been someone like that, right? Okay, James is going, yeah, we, we all have this issue. We all struggle. And we read this and we go, what do we, what do, we do with that? Like, how do we fix that? How do we change? And if you're anything like me, you, you, you go to the practical stuff, right? You tell yourself, I'm gonna write an encouraging note once a week. Every single week, I'm gonna write an encouraging note. And I'm gonna, you try to change that. Or I've talked to people who put like a rubber band on their wrist. And anytime they say something that they wish they hadn't, they like snap their wrist as if like, you know, they're gonna get trained not to do that. And you get really practical and you think, I'm just gonna try harder. You see, James is saying, James says there's a problem with our words. So we often, to try, we often try to change the way we talk, right? Because that's where the problem is. So conventional wisdom would say, well, just stop it. There's been times I've talked to people and they keep tripping up in the same way. And I just, I, I, I kind of don't know what to say anymore. And I just, I want to be like, just stop it. You know, just quit doing it. And we do that with ourselves. We think, oh, clearly, if I say things that are dumb, I just need to quit saying things that are dumb. And we get ourselves in the cycle where we don't change. We just think trying harder, working more. You know, if I just really bear down, if I really, if I try really hard, I'll get better. We fool ourselves because it doesn't work that way. And James actually speaks to this. You see what happens is he goes on, he talks about the power of the tongue and he talks about how like a rudder on a ship can steer a huge boat, our tongue can shift and change the direction of our life. And he talks the power of the tongue and all of these things. And then in verse 13, if you open up a Bible and you turn to verse 13, it's a new paragraph probably. It's probably a new heading above it talking about wisdom. And it, this is what it feels like many times when we read this chapter that James is talking about the tongue and we all struggle with this. And yes, life and death come in the tongue and it's powerful and we got it. You know, if anybody can get this in check, they can get their whole life in check. And he talks about that and he goes, okay, done. Next topic, let's talk about wisdom. And he kicks off verse 13 and he says this. He says, do you want to be counted as wise to build a reputation for wisdom? And it seems like, like James kind of has ADD, right? And he's like, squirrel, you know? And he's like, let's talk about wisdom now. And he changes the subject all of a sudden. But we gotta remember that this is a letter. This is one continuous thought that James is talking about the tongue. And then he continues on and says, do you wanna be counted as wise? And he says this, he says, here's what you do. So he gives a solution. Live well, live wisely, live humbly. It's the way you, uh, it's the way you live, not the way you talk that counts. Now, this is counterintuitive. You might be sitting there going, hold on, wait a minute. It's, it's the way I live, not the way I talk, so I can say anything? Sweet, I'm good at that, right? Like, and it's not what James is saying. And I want you to look at this last part. It's the way you live, not the way you talk that counts. Here's what James is saying. You can focus all day long on, on the results, on the symptoms, but there's a cause to it. And it's the way we live it's the way we look at our life. That's the main, that's the cause. And if you address that, you can take care of the symptom. See, when we focus on the symptom, when we just focus on our words, it's like putting the cart before the horse. It's the tail that's wagging the dog, right? We're, we're putting the wrong thing in priority. James says, listen, focus on the way you're living your life. He says, the way to change the words is to adjust your walk. 
The way to change your words is to adjust your walk. Now, what does he mean by that? What is he getting at? The way to change your words is to adjust your walk. You see, it's putting focus on something else. You see, like I said, this isn't conventional wisdom. This isn't what the world teaches us. See, because what gets the attention of the world, is, is it the person in the trenches doing the hard work? No, it's the sound bite that gets all the clicks, right? I mean, that's what everybody wants. Everybody wants the one-liner. Everybody pays attention to words, not actions. You see, somewhere where this is probably most clear right now, at least as I look at our culture as a whole, if you're a sports nut, you probably know about this. If you aren't a sports nut, it's okay. There's a really, really big fight coming up in a few weeks. And it's between Conor McGregor and Floyd Mayweather. Now, here's the thing about these two individuals. These aren't like the best fighters who've ever lived. Now, this will be the largest pay-per-view event the world has ever seen the biggest sporting event when it comes to money and probably viewership. I mean, this is a big, big deal. And you have a star from the MMA against a boxing star, undefeated boxing star. Now, here's the thing. The boxer is out of his prime. He's been retired. Do you know why this fight is such a big deal? Is it because like the number one in MMA versus the number one in boxing? No. Is it because everyone wants to see if the, this great boxer can come back out of retirement? No. The reason this is a big deal is because they're really good at talking trash. That's it. Like these guys talked their way into a hundred million dollar plus payday. That's it. Like they actually went on a tour where the point of it was to go around and to talk trash. That was it. These are the loudest, cockiest fighters that have probably ever lived and they're getting paid, right? Like because they talked it up so much. There's been so much heat. And listen, we buy into it. I'll buy into it. I'll get some guys together. I will watch this, right? Like, and we do because that catches our attention. The world says what we say matters most. It's what we say matters most. It's the image you put on. You can live differently behind the scenes. You don't have to be the best. Just make people think you're the best. That's what matters. See, but James says something completely different. See, James speaks about wisdom a different way. He talks about the way we live differently. In verse 17, he says this. He says, but the wisdom that comes from heaven is pure. That's the most important thing about it. And that's not all. It also loves peace. It thinks about others. It obeys. It is full of mercy and good fruit. It is fair. It doesn't pretend to be what it's not. See, this is different than what our culture celebrates. James is getting at something different. And remember, he's, he's, he's linking together our words and wisdom together here. He's saying the solution so the problem with words is living a life of wisdom. That's the solution that James is proposing here. In fact, James is saying that wisdom actually isn't about being right. Wisdom is actually about living right. See, what we like to, to do is we like to have the right answers, don't we? Like we, we like to be right and we like to prove other people wrong. At least many of us do. I'll admit, I know I do. Like when I have a position, when I have an idea, when I have a solution, my goal is now to get you to believe like I do. Because I'm right. And listen, I could agree with you, but then we'd both be wrong. So what's the point of that, right? Like we all want to be right. And that to us seems like the most important thing is to believe the right things. And see, this doesn't just happen in culture. We've gotta be honest. This happens in the church world too. In fact, I'd say it happens a lot in the church world. Denominations are framed up along theological beliefs and deciding who's in and who's out. This person believes this thing, so they're on the outside, but not all the way on the outside, just outside of us. And this person believes something real crazy to us. So we're gonna say they're all the way out. And, and we, we set up these frameworks about who's in and who's out about believing the right thing. And what's interesting is Jesus talked more about the way people live. And the things that Jesus celebrated and highlighted weren't right beliefs as much as he focused on right actions. That's why our goal, our mission here at Icon Church isn't to get a group of people to believe the right things. Because if we can be honest, I mean, can we just get really honest right now? If God exists, and I think all of us would say he does, then probably, like the Bible says, his thoughts are above our thoughts. His ways are above our ways. We look back in church history and see where church history got it wrong time after time again. If we were to take all of our beliefs, we're probably wrong on some of them. Like if I were to hold all of our beliefs, it'd be incredibly arrogant to say in the West, in America, in 2017, we finally got it right. 
Like throughout church history, like they've been wrong, they've been dummies, but we got it figured out, right? So if we're being intellectually honest, we'd probably say some of this is wrong and some of this is right. The scary thing is we don't know which is which. <laughs> like, and what we, what we do so many times, we pick one of those things out. We say, this is the one that's gonna decide who's in and who's out. And we're just pulling from a group of things that we could be wrong on. Let's look most to the things that Jesus looked most to. What Jesus pointed to were these things. What James is talking about is about living right. You see, there's been this age old adage. It's been attributed to everyone from Teddy Roosevelt to uh, leadership teacher, John Maxwell. And it says this, says people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. See, we can sit here as a church and tell people all the right things, but if they don't know how much we care, it's not gonna mean a thing. See, if I can stand on this stage and I can be one person and I can say one thing, but if you were to meet me in life and I was a jerk or I was mean or I was cold, would you care about what I said on this stage? Would you give me a second if you knew in real life, you saw me, you know, maybe at a restaurant and I just was rude and disrespectful to a waiter or waitress and just treated them horribly. When I got back up on the stage the next week, what would you think? Would you listen to a thing I said? No. What about the people that, that made you feel the best, that made sure you knew they cared. When they spoke, their words carried a certain weight, didn't they? See, so if we wanna talk about words today, if we wanna talk about the things we say, I think we should first focus on the things that James is focusing on, the way we live, how we treat people with dignity and honor and respect, that we make sure that people feel a certain way, See, what broke my heart a year ago or whenever this political stuff was going on and the elections were going on is that people that claimed to be followers of Jesus were so ugly and nasty on social media to each other. I saw people that, that sat in the same church be ugly towards each other because of a political belief. See, my prayer is that this room, I, I want you to be engaged socially. I want you to be engaged civically. But my prayer is that this would be a room of diversity that this church wouldn't be red, that this church wouldn't be blue, that it'd be purple. It'd be all the colors of the rainbow because we have all these political ideologies, all these beliefs, that when we come together and we say, what puts us together, what unites us is more important than that which separates us. So listen, we don't need uniformity, but what we need today is unity. So let's be the church of Jesus. See, because Paul Paul wasn't writing to a person. Paul was writing to a community. He was writing to the church. He was writing to a group of people. And see, sometimes we miss this when we read the Bible because many times today we've all got Bibles and you can open it up yourself. You can get it on your phone and we read it personally and we read like it's about us. And when we read things like you do this, we think it's like, oh, it's talking to me. But, but James is actually writing to a group of people. James would fit really well in the South because many times when it says you, it's actually plural. So it'd be y'all, like y'all need to do this. Up North, we don't get y'all. Like we have you guys and it's dumb, you know, but, but you see James would fit in down here because I want you to look at what he says, remembering that he's talking to a community. Y'all, you all can develop a healthy, robust community that lives right with God and enjoys the, its results only if you do the hard work of getting along with each other, treating each other with dignity and honor. It's almost like James has been in a church for a while because he knows what can happen so many times. He knows that there can be disagreements and people can get offended and you know, people's words become harsh. And he says, you know what? He says it's, it's hard work. And he says, you can be that kind of community. You can develop a healthy and robust community that lives right with God. And we can get to enjoy the results of that only if, only if we're willing to do the hard work of getting along and treating each other with dignity and with honor. James is saying, listen, listen. Yes, our words matter. Our words matter more than you know. But how to change your words is to focus on living rightly with God. It's to honor each other, to respect each other, to, to walk humbly with your beliefs. In fact, James says that what we need to do today 
is we need to choose living right over being right. We need to choose living right over being right. There have been so many times that I've chosen being right over living right. And can we just all, I mean, what would happen in this community if we all chose to live open-handedly with those things? Say, you know what? Being right on this issue, on this argument, doesn't matter as much to me as living right in community with you and loving you well. I mean, what would happen if we became a church, if we became a community that did this? That when people came up and wanted to argue with us about something, we just said, you know, I'm gonna treat you with honor and dignity and respect. Because Jesus did that constantly. There were times that he came to talk to somebody about what was going on in their life. And the person realized that he was a Jew and they had a kind of a different belief structure and they launched into theological beliefs and you say that you, your people should worship here and we say that we should. And Jesus goes, no, 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 listen, I'm not here to argue. I actually come to bring you life. If you want that, you can have it. He doesn't even engage in the argument. There are times that people drag people before Jesus and say, the law says this, the text says this, what are you gonna do, Jesus. And he shows love. He shows that person dignity and respect and honor. He doesn't get down into the fray. What would happen if we were a church like that, that valued unity over uniformity? See, I think something powerful could happen. I think when we start to focus on that, our words would begin, begin to come into alignment. That we'd have to worry less about saying something mean or hurtful because it came from a different place in our heart. So the problem isn't with our tongue. The problem's our heart. And when we focus on this first, the tongue will begin to line up. And my prayer for this room is that we would be a church that would focus on the things that Jesus focuses on. That we would be a church that would choose living right over being right. Amen? So my homework for all of you today is to go out from this place and to do that to put this into practice. Because it's one thing to stand on a stage and talk about. It's one thing to sit in a chair and listen to and agree with and go, oh yeah, I need to do that. And it's another thing to walk it out out there. When you go back to work and you have that boss that's always cutting and cruel and you want to say to your coworkers those sarcastic comments and cut your boss down, you choose not to. As you go back to school, kids out there, and there are some kids at, in your neighborhood or kids at school that are mean, and you choose to not be mean back to them, but to treat them with respect. As all of us go back to our various lives, as we go back to our families, that we remember this. That we remember, today, I'm going to choose living right over being right. I'm gonna choose living right over being right living right over being right. And as we do that, our words will come into alignment with that kind of wisdom, the wisdom of Jesus. So my challenge for you is to go out there and to live right, and to do that and put this hard work into practice. And as we work hard at this, I believe that we'll enjoy the fruit and the benefits of living in harmony with each other and living in harmony with God. Let me pray for you. God, I thank you so much.